Hello folks, my name is Showtime, and I'm here to show you a game I've been waiting to talk about for quite some time now. This here is Feudums. Feudums is a grand promise from the lineages of games such as Tribal Wars, Battle Dawn, and Sid Meier's Civilization. This is, to undersell it slightly, a grand turn-based strategy MMO. Now, what exactly does that look like? We'll see in a moment here. This is an early access game, so there's still plenty of stuff that's being worked on, but for the purposes of showing it off for this uh, Steam promotion, I figured let's go through it a little bit, and I'll walk you through the basics. First and foremost, when you join the game, you're prompted to create your great house, your noble house, as it were. Uh, you're going to create your family crest, and you'll decide on what your generic culture is going to be, and so forth. This is something I'll cover in a little more detail in a moment, but for the moment, let's just get into a game. Worlds. This is uh, the meat and potatoes of the game as far as being able to see what's going on. As you can see, I've played many games. I kind of know what I'm talking about when it comes to this one. And for the purposes of this demo, we actually have a specific one set up, so thank you to the dev for doing that for me. We're going to click on the world, and we'll be able to hit join, but first, let's look it over. So, at the moment, you can see it's not currently going, so uh, if we actually had anyone in the game, it would be ticking down. Ticks are how you measure the game. It is the maximum length of the game. So you can see uh, here, this is a two-day game with one minute long ticks. Now, this guy is actually a little longer. I think he's one minute 30 seconds. So these are all configurable settings. Uh, see here. So right now you can see that they're currently on tick 537 out of 3,660. Uh, this is just so that games don't last forever. You can adjust them. You could go for a marathon game of like eight weeks, or you could have one that's a couple of hours. It really depends on what you feel like doing. Uh, next, you can see what season it's in, because seasons are actually a pretty big part of this game and how it works. So early spring, tick one of five, late autumn, tick one of five. Uh, you can also see your population here. So you can have a pretty impressive number of players in one world, uh, even for this early access level of stuff. But uh, in this case, it is a very simple 24 starting locations, 24 people versus 56 as their maximum, and 185 starting locations, just to give you an idea of the kind of scaling you can deal with. In this world, you're going to have a lot more elbow room than this one, but uh, it's also a bigger world, as you can see. So, let's uh, kick this off, shall we? I'm going to join the game, and it's going to prompt me to create a noble. So, you're playing as a noble house, but in each of these worlds, you rep you're going to be represented by a noble lord or lady of that family. You'll get your chance to name them. So, in this case, uh, we're going to go with Leonardo. Uh, and his starting town will be called Mayfalls. I can do that without throwing in a random, unnecessary caps. Next, you can see, this is where I was talking about the culture. So this is a specifically a visual flavor thing, but it does give some nice variety when you're looking over the world map. And the stuff you chose for your house to begin with is just your default. You can, of course, branch out and decide on what you want to do from here. Uh, so in this case, we're just going to stick with Western, because that's the good old classic. I could then decide to create a variation on my family coat of arms. So as you'd see in history, uh, many nobles would end up taking the chance to do almost a remix of their house crest. So in this case, you click that and it'll show you, hey, look at that. You can slightly tweak it to create your own custom. So it's not going to be from the start. There are some things that are locked in, but I can still make some changes like saying, hey, well, this one's going to be a leather shield. Uh, we're going to make this on wooden planks, or maybe I want to mess around with the frames. Maybe I'd like it to be a golden shield. And uh, maybe I want it to be heavily battle scarred to show that this guy is a veteran of many wars. That kind of thing. So. These are the visual elements of this game. It is worth noting that this, while entirely cosmetic, is both really well created, because you can see how every part of this heraldry has been put together for the specific purpose of telling you what it would have meant historically. So you can kind of tell a bit of a story there and get into it, which personally I love as the kind of guy who enjoys kind of role-playing a bit in games. But more importantly, uh, this is actually where I get to talk a little bit about how the game works long term. So. 
over time, uh, you're going to accomplish things in the game, and by doing that, you're going to unlock new elements for your family crests. Uh, for, or I guess that the coat of arms, let's go with that. Uh, so you can adjust your coat of arms as you go in a way that is very satisfying and represents your various achievements over time. You can also choose to support the game uh, through their Patreon or through purchasing the game, what have you, in order to get some fun little premium perks, and by that I mean completely cosmetic things that just allow you to look fancier. Uh, for example, I'm pretty certain that this golden trim is something that is for people who have financially supported the game, which, if I haven't mentioned it yet, is going to be entirely free to play. As a result, this is essentially taking the Tribal Wars promise of a grander, more open-world, uh, turn-based thing, and removing the element of pay to win that essentially destroyed it in my mind. I absolutely adored those games growing up. They were a big part of what I enjoyed doing with my brother. We would play together and have some fun with that. But it always got ruined because some guy with a bigger wallet and or a day job, because we were like 10 or 11, couldn't actually compete uh, against him buying faster troops or better production or just hitting you harder. So as a result, this game, and the fact that the dev is so dedicated to not playing the pay-to-win element of this game, he's actually had to turn down one or two publishers, from what I've heard, because they just wanted him to turn it into essentially a glorified mobile game in terms of, like, trying to extract wealth from its players. So, everything of this is going to be cosmetic. This is a really cool setup, and if you're like me, and you want to play the game and try it out, I will warn you, you click and drag. Uh, one of the QI fixes I've recommended is putting arrows here, so you can see that there's more. This particular uh, setting does not have more, but as you can see here, uh, you will otherwise think that there is only, like, five different crests when there are several more charges or what have you. So, anyway, coat of arms. It's a cool concept. I love it. It's well-researched, and you can kind of tell a neat story with it. But we're going to go back. We're just going to stick with the vanilla style. Uh, and he doesn't seem to have kept his name uh, for his city. So let's go do that. You can see the trace and drawbacks. That will be a thing, but it's not currently. Essentially, there will be some kind of a persistence element to the game that allows you to specialize your family in a specific way, shape, or form. Uh, if you have to go to Crusader Kings or some such, uh, this would be the equivalent to the Legacy Trees or some such. These are smaller bonuses, but they still represent what your family has established their reputation for and what they've gotten good at. So this is the game. As you can see, it bears more than a passing resemblance to the hex-based glory of civilization. And that's not where the similarities end. So, let's talk about the interface, because this is the thing that a lot of people struggle with, and something that I struggled with too. So, I'm going to take a moment and walk you through this. There are four different tabs. There is the company scope level, this is your military, this is where you will find your troops and their upkeep costs, your feudum scope level, which tells you about what is essentially a, a state, a province, or what have you in your direct holdings or kingdom. So, Mayfalls is the capital of this feudum. And then you can go to the tile scope level, which focuses specifically on the one tile you're on. And then the dominion scope level, which is your entire holdings, your many feudums, your nation, your kingdom, what have you. Now, Let's walk through each of these, and I'll kind of give you a broad overview of what they're useful for. So, militarily, as you can see, it's just showing me my one military guy. This is my house guard. Everybody starts with a house guard. Life is good. You have some basic starting troops to keep you safe. I say as though there isn't... There's actually an invincibility period to give you a second to get set up so that the guy who's been here longer than you doesn't just, well, do the equivalent of SEAL clubbing in a Call of Duty lobby on... December 21st. All those kids who are just getting started from the holiday season. Now, uh, <laughs> that's a really out-of-date reference, but here we are. Anyway, you're safe for a little bit to help you get your training wheels sorted. This is your military side. You can see exactly what troops you have on that specific tile. At a glance, this 8 here also tells you the military strength on that tile, in case that makes it easier. Next, you can go to the Feudum Scope level. This allows you to see the details of your Feudum and its specialties. So, in this case, it would tell you what it's producing. In this case, if you give it 13 seconds, the game will tick over for its first tick, which is how they measure production. So you'll see these numbers update to show you what it produced during that tick. 
Uh, in this case, you can see the size of the feudum. So that's, there was a maximum size. Here you can see it's between three and seven. The maximum size of your non-feudum tiles that you still claim but don't have an estate is eight. We'll talk about that in a minute. Normal. So this is your food rationing. You could decide, hey, uh, I'm running low on food. I'm going to set this place to half rations. Your taxes. You could decide, hey, I'm going to be King Richard here and just absolutely tax the shit out of these peasants. You can decide on health. Uh, this is a lot of dynamic stuff, basically, based off of what jobs are being worked, how much food you have, what season it is, and how populous your settlements are. So how many housing is available. As you can see here, this is the population, this is your number of jobs, and here are all the jobs in more detail. So you could hover over them and say, hey, these are my hunters, they produce three food and they don't need anything to do their jobs. As opposed to stuff like a tavern keep, who requires three food and produces seven social well-being. Again, these are just advanced concepts that allow you to understand how everything kind of feeds into everything else. Next, tile level. This talks about this specific tile. You can see it contains a village. It has the western theme. It is currently operating, so your theodom hasn't collapsed, basically. How many families you have? 20. How many houses you have? 75. So there's plenty of room to grow. You can also see it's a grassland. So if I click off here, you can see this grassland doesn't have a city on it, and it is 12 food production just naturally. Different tiles produce different things. So if I go down here to this hill, you can see, hey, this produces four food without anyone working it and two stone. Or the plains, which is a little more food and a little less stone compared to hills. Forests are another big one. So in this case, I'm going to give you the tutorial on claiming things. If I hit lay claim while selecting a tile that is not in a feudum, that allows me to say, hey, I want to claim this. Then it'll ask me to attach it to a nearby feudum. You have to have tiles that are claimed adjacent to the one you want to claim. So I'm going to click on this, and we're going to confirm this. So we have added this to this feudum. However, as you can see by this red sign and the little exclamation mark, it's not done yet. I have to click this little dove in the bottom right in order to tell you guys that, hey, uh, this is, in fact, a order that I want to send to the server. This is the central server, and if you don't do that, you can't confirm it. I'm also realizing now that, you guys, I'm going to hide my webcam here so you get a better sense of what we're looking at. So I'm going to just quickly walk you through what my webcam will be covering on average. You can see all of your total resources, your food, your wood, your stone, your iron, and your gold. Food is produced by farms, lakes, hunters, and just naturally by certain tiles. Your timber is created almost exclusively by your forests, though it can be gained from swamps as well. Stone is created from quarries, uh, which are made on top of hills and mountains. Iron is likewise. And coins are usually gained from special trading tiles, so uh, if you were... So you can see here, this is actually a C. This naturally produces some coins, but you can assign people to be a merchant on this tile, which means they will consume some goods, which are produced by your towns, and turn them into coins and social well-being. This is just a general idea, but usually you're going to get your coins from taxing the various citizens of your settlements. This, of course, will impact the settlement health, yada, 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 growth rate. You get the idea. So I have set a claim that is processing in my Dominion queue. This is the national queue. However, if I click on Mayfalls here, I can choose to construct an improvement. This allows me to decide to upgrade my town along its particular building path. Now, each of these upgrades has a new upkeep cost. So if I'm upgrading it to a town, you can see the cost just to upgrade it, and then you can see the new combined upkeep cost. This blue symbol here is virtue. Virtue is over here. It represents your nobility, your standing, what have you. It's just another currency, but it comes from different sources, and it has a very important endgame goal in mind. So virtue is used for claiming things, and as you get more stuff, the cost for claiming more tiles will go up. Your virtue is created by your towns and by your ecclesiastical 
fiefs, which I'm just going to be referring to as churches from now on, or religious buildings, because frankly, that's a bit of a mouthful. So some things will actually cost virtuous upkeep as well. Specifically, certain uh, units do like to cost that as well. You can change terrain. So for example, if there were no forests nearby, I could take one of these grasslands and say, I would like to make that a forest so I don't die from lack of wood. Here you can see the ecclesiastical fiefs that I was talking about a second ago. Henceforth, just churches. These guys are your heavy uh, virtue production buildings, let's say. They cost a little money, but they create stuff like priests, monks, uh, artisans. These are people who will do more advanced jobs. They will also be a source of physicians at some point, and they do offer a little bit of housing, as you can see here. Certainly not as much as a city, and it's not upgradable, as you can tell by there being only one dot here relative to something like a hamlet. But it's a small way to fill out your region and give you a few more fief, uh, and give you a few more jobs. As you can see, the claim has just gone through, and at a glance, you can actually tell that someone is working this position, because you can see all these little loggers out here. While I'm thinking about it, because frankly, this is going to be a pretty rambling tutorial, so <laughs> stick with me. You can see laborer designation. This is because a forest can be used for three mutually exclusive things. Woodcutters, whose whole thing is that they produce, no they consume nothing and they'll produce wood. Hunters, who will decide to shoot deer in here. Or Woodwards, whose whole concept are that they will consume coins, but they'll produce some virtue for you, and create safety for nearby settlements. This is essentially your game wardens who protect the king's forest and ensure that it's not going to be overrun by various this, that, and the other things. So, these mutually exclusive options allow you to specialize. If you have more than one forest, it's not just going to create an absolute overwhelming amount of wood that you have nothing to do with. Let's go back in. Uh, well, let's, let's, let's build something. Let's get started there. I'm going to construct an improvement. Let's build a farmland. Now, your farmland is important because this is how you're going to create various bits and pieces of food. As you can see, it still has not been processed. If you hover over here, it tells you that. So if you don't send it in, it won't happen during the next tick. So we're going to tell them to build some farmland right here. It's next to a river, so that's actually going to help us out a little bit because that's going to give us some access to fresh water, which in turn will help city health. So we're building a farmland. Let's also, while I'm thinking about it, let's build a further improvement. So after we're done that, you can queue up multiple things. We're going to upgrade to a town. As you can see, that takes even longer. We'll commit to that. And now that's just in the queue for that feudum. If I had more than one feudum, I could potentially be queuing up something different in each of them. Hey, I have a neighbor. So as you can see here, somebody else has arrived in this world. And they are represented as Irak Ball. Let's let's go with that. Um, I'm just going to call it Ira, or Ball, as it were. Uh, hey, look at that! So you can see the first turn of this construction has happened. That means it shows up. You get a little icon telling you what you're building, and life is good. I am going to also decide to lay claim to this lovely territory. That is some sea. That's going to give me some food and potentially some money for my troubles. That's in the Dominion queue, so that's not going to slow down my construction of farmland or a town. Uh, let's see. So other things I can tell you guys about. In the meanwhile, let's grab a little bit of my feudum here. So you can see here I could create a separate feudum. This is something important because at a certain point I'm going to build a church here or potentially somewhere over here. Point is, I'm going to build another building, and I'm going to be able to designate it the capital of a new province. This will split my feudum in two, and allow me to expand with two feudums without hitting my maximum tile per feudum cap. The reason this is important is because this ties into something quite exciting. It's not in the game yet, but it is already got mechanical support, so you know it's got to be good. This is vassal ship. So, the important idea is that there's only so much land you can directly control. In the future, you will be able to subjugate people. You can create feudal agreements. You can say, hey, I'll serve you, but you have to protect me, and I'll pay you some taxes, or what have you. This allows you to essentially build a proper kingdom. At this point, I am a baron, but if I were to subjugate enough people, or 
diplomatically maneuver my way into being their liege, I would be able to create a kingdom. And this ties into the end game. So let's go have a quick look at how on earth you win this game. In this particular world, because again, everything about this is so bloody configurable, it's ridiculous. And at some point, you will be able to create your own custom games. Seeing as we're still in a pretty early alpha stage, we're not even feature complete. We are only running community games based off of generic settings, but you can still weigh in and ask for specific settings. And I'm certain that they would be more than happy to accommodate you. Lord knows they've done enough of my ideas. So, let's talk about how you win. There are individual victory conditions, and eventually, again, once vassalship and diplomacy and such are a little more refined in the game, there will also be uh, alliance victory conditions. So let's talk about individual first. Persona at the end of the game has the most virtue. Remember how I talked about tick limits? Well, this is it. If you were to run out of ticks in a game and you run out of time, the guy with the most virtue just wins. Now, this is pretty important because the remaining uh, the remaining ones actually ask a fair bit of you. So you could win by having more than 2,000 population, a good 3, 3 million or 300,000. Man, my eyes are going. Uh, 3 million. 3 million food and more than uh, 175 million timber. So like a lot of resources. And similarly, you could choose to specialize into stone and iron, or just tax the ever-loving hell out of your people and have a ton of money and decide to Scrooge McDuck into it as a significant, shall we say, proclamation of your victory. A, a literal victory lap via breaststroke. So you can choose to specialize your feudums to try and get one of the four current victory conditions. This means that you and only you win. But in the future, there will be alliance victory conditions, which are the idea that if you are serving, you are, shall we say, a vassal or you are the liege of a kingdom or alliance that wins, then you all win. And the guy who's the highest up the chain, the king, gets the biggest rewards and then diminishing rewards based on where in the hierarchy you are. So if you want to launch your own pyramid scheme and get people in on the ground floor, well, guess what? You're still the king and you get the biggest rewards. Now, let's, uh, let's move on a quick moment here, because I'm noticing that our time is ticking along. As you can see, we're in early summer. Now, I'm going to turn back on my webcam here, because I don't think there's that much left to do. Actually, let's quickly walk over seasonal labors. So, the important thing to note here is that seasonal labors are basically the game's way of s simulating the peasant life. So, in summer, you would be, you wouldn't have planted your crops, they'd already be planted. This is a growing season. And in order to better demonstrate how incredibly detailed this is, let's go to labor assignments. As you can see, there are four seasons, and these are all of the possible jobs you could end up doing for each part of the season. You can, in turn, decide to tweak this formula. I admittedly lack a little confidence with this, but you could decide to say, hey, I require artisans. I cannot allow there to be any less artisans than a lot. So you could guarantee that every artisan job is filled, essentially allowing you to set your priorities. And then you could send that to the whole season. There is a ridiculous amount of tweaking your population you can do. However, I will state that as a guy who hasn't really fiddled with this, you can usually get away with the generic auto-assigned jobs because they're already in a pretty intelligent order. Your guys who produce wood and food will always have priority if you're going by the default setup. It's also worth noting that it tells you at what parts of the season you're doing what. So you're sowing spring crops in the first two parts, but you aren't in the late spring. At that point, you're just looking at winter crops, apparently. And you're seeing mature livestock, which we'll talk about that in a second, because that's part of the farm that we're going to build. <laughs> There's a lot here, if you couldn't tell. So you can set your individual assignments based on where you want them to be. You can have a quick look at what the advanced stuff are. So for example, uh, all of these, and this is a great time to give mad props for the tooltips in this game, because if you hover over something, there's a very good chance, even at this early stage, you're going to get a lot of clarification on what it does and how it's useful. In this case, for example, physicians. These guys are trained in early universities, uh, which is just code for your churches, by and large, or a highly upgraded city. This produces coins, gives you virtue, and public health, like so much public health. And then, so if you wanted to make a priority out of a really healthy city, you could decide to make that a guaranteed position to be full. 
In this case, you can see that I think actually this may have carried over from a previous game because I always prioritized physicians because I always seem to struggle with keeping my cities healthy. And as you can see, our farm is complete, which is excellent. Look at that cute little farm. Now, uh, if we have a quick peek, I am going to turn this webcam back on. There we go. Hi, welcome back. It's me. So let's go to the town. Uh, well, not the town, the farm here, though you can see that the town is being upgraded. I can choose to set up my farmland, because again, this game is ridiculous in the best way. As you can see, land distribution allows you to support 10 herd size and 150 crops. You can change that. You can say, this is actually pastoral land. This We don't grow anything here, we just graze our herds. And that allows you to have herds which produce food more or less year-round. You can also decide how big a herd you want. And if you've decided to recently increase the size of your herding lands, you could decide to say, hey, I'm going to buy some additional stuff. How do you buy? Well, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked. You're full of great questions. You'd go to the world market. Now, the world market in particular is not a super fancy thing at this stage. We have enough economics to be able to mess around with it, but it is at a glance quite intimidating. So let me walk you through how this works. Step one, demand. This is how much of a particular good the market wants, i.e. the maximum amount you can sell at once. Your market fees is how much of what you sell is going to go to taxes to the world market, just overhead. And here is your selling price, how much you will sell for. This will fluctuate based on what you sell and what you buy. Buying price, this is the cost you pay to buy things. The market fees is the added tax on top of that. And then the supply is the maximum amount you can buy at once. You'll also see here there's a minimum and maximum price for each good. So if you're intending to play the market game, certain uh, resources are more valuable than others. For example, iron caps out at 14 per unit, whereas food caps out at 5.78. Again, all of these are configurable and actively being balanced depending on what people decide they want to do. Now, this is a game, as you can see, with 60-second ticks. You might be thinking to yourself, well, how on earth do I walk away from this? Like, I can't take a break, I'm going to miss too much. Understandable. There is obviously a certain amount of you could lose out if you decide to walk away for too long and your neighbor gets grand aspirations of being the lord of all that you own. But, as far as economics go, if you're operating at a deficit, for example, if I hover over here, you can see I have an expense of two ore. That's being paid to military wages, which we will talk about a little later. Basically, how do I solve that problem? Auto trade! Because, again, a lot of the economy is already pretty bloody well set up at this point. It's just trading between players that needs a little more time in the oven before it's ready to roll out for everyone. Supplies-wise, you're going to see the exact same idea, except now you're going to be configuring this yourself. So, I can say, I have food. If my stockpile is less than a thousand food, I want them to buy X amount of food, and the maximum amount I'm willing to pay per unit is five. Whereas I could also click on the cell tab and say, I have a ton of food. So if I have more than 10,000 food, I'm going to sell X amount, as long as I'm guaranteed to make this much per unit. Now, these are set separately and are things that you, generally speaking, want to pay attention to because if you forget about this, you might be kind of confused where some of your stuff is going. If I were to say, hey, I'm, I, I'm guilty of this. A story from one of my first games was I set up a thing to let me sell excess food because I was making so much of it at the time. And I said, sell X amount for X uh, gold and I just set that and I forgot about it. Fast forward probably a day, I now had three cities to feed and I was really struggling to stockpile any food for some reason for winter. And it was because I had still had this auto trade going. So this is very much a, you can be hoisted by your own petard if you aren't careful, but it is a very powerful tool that allows you to overcome the lack of a mountain near you or if you can't get to hills in time. Here's something useful. So you can see this, this is waste ground. This is ground that is not assigned to a fiefdom, but is still claimed. As you can see, it costs you gold and virtue just to have it, and the more you have, the more expensive it gets. So you are emphasized to make use of the ground you claim. 
Now, uh, let's see here. We're 12, 12 minutes, basically, out from building a town. I'm going to queue up something else, because I feel like it. We're going to create a wooden palisade, because that is my military building. This is where I'm going to build a bunch of my future stuff. So let me show you a little bit about the military before we get to the palisade. This palisade is going to allow me to make advanced troops, but it's not the only troops I can make. So if we go along the side here, you can see construction, you can see demolishing improvements, you can do your labor assignments, feudum rules, let's quickly touch on that. That's literally just letting you set your food rations and your tax rates on what your particular fiefdom, or in this case, I guess, city, would have to conform to. So you could say, hey, you only get X amount of food per family, or hey, you're paying this much per family. Generally speaking, leaving this alone is fine. If you're struggling for food, half rations is good, but it will hurt the overall health of your settlement and its growth. You can absolutely have people move away from your cities, or I guess die of starvation, depending, or, or sickness, if you decide to get a little too uh, corner cutting about this sort of thing. Miserly, if you will. So, Let's go to Manor. This is just telling you, hey, I can select a capital of this area. I could decide to choose a castle or what else. There actually isn't anything else right now. It would be a castle or a church you could assign, as you can see. But I don't have one built, so it doesn't much matter. I could also choose to rename. I could change the name of the feudum itself and the settlement or city that it is attached to. I could choose to add tiles to a region, so if I had multiple feudums, I could swap them back and forth. If I had some waste ground, I could add it. That kind of thing. And now the exciting part. Rallying troops. So this is where you're going to see your various troop possibilities. There are two types of troops. I will go over them in a moment. Here you have armed peasants. This is a good example. So as you can see, it costs 10 food and 10 gold, and will take two ticks to recruit these guys. However, they also have a an upkeep every tick of one food. You can see their stats here for attack, armor, uh, health, essentially. It's manpower. Uh, and then morale damage, which is a whole other thing to deal with. And this. This is important. So lances or professional squads. This is a pretty cool part. So lances are essentially conscri conscripted levies. They're units you took from the population of wherever you recruited them. This means it actually takes from the population of that settlement. It removes families from your settlement and means that jobs can go vacant. However, they are cheap compared to professional mercenaries, who in this case are... Let me actually find one. I believe this is technically one of them. Oh no, no, this is a this is still a lance. Where are they? Here we go. Professional squad. So professional squads cost a lot more. Up front, you're paying some virtue, some money, some iron, some wood, some food, and all of those seem to have an upkeep afterwards. However, the way they work is different. So if you lose a conscripted unit, all of that population is gone forever. A conscripted unit also only agrees to serve for a certain amount of time. This means that warfare is going to happen in spring very seldomly, because spring is planting season. You need people to take care of that. Summer is when everything is growing but not being harvested yet, and fall is when all the harvesting happens. So, generally speaking, as soon as it's summertime, you're going to start throwing war at each other. Uh, that is to say, of course, if you're using conscripted units. These professional units work a little differently. Like I said, they have a cost, but they also have an indefinite duration. They will stick around as long as they want. They take longer to cost, uh, longer to recruit, and their upkeep is usually much pricier, but they also hit harder. They're generally better overall. They don't have a length of service. As you can see, Lance is here. Pretty pricey. Uh, but at the same time, as long as you can pay them, they'll stick around, which is the important part. Now, let's see here. Uh, what's a good example for you? As you can see, the requirements for recruiting heavy cavalry, I need to have a castle, or I need to have a city with a stone wall. So I need an advanced city, or I need a specific military building that has been invested into in order to recruit more advanced units. Again, just a good way to let you diversify each fief, because, again, these fiefs, Let's give you an example here. If I said I wanted some bowmen, added the unit type, that goes in my queue. I can hit confirm, and that'll show up in my feudum queue. That means that it's per area, and you won't be able to recruit from every area just because you have a castle in one of your provinces. 
Uh, let's see, what else can I talk about at this exact moment? Because I'm really just buying time until we hit winter, but let's go on. Uh, let's see. So, let's talk a little bit more about the city itself. Now, you can see right now, I am on the tile view. What I want to be is on the feudum view, because that will show me my various details of this feudum. Right now, I am consuming 36 food. I am not actually making a great profit. This is because farms are still planting. I am not actively producing as much food as I could. Because if I wanted to, I could probably do some herding, which is lesser food, but, well, it's also less reliable in that sense. Because yes, you will have food all the year round, but if something happens, compared to fishing, if somebody comes over to stand on your farm with a bunch of pitchforks and torches, also known as raiding, you're out of food. Farms can produce the most food of, out of anything in the game, but they are not the most reliable source uh, against enemy attacks. That would actually be coastal territories. So this here, this forest, could still also produce some food, as you may recall from labor designation. And we're getting some food from... Reminder, uh, when I clicked here and it said a whole bunch of stuff here, that is the entire province. So you can see this province is currently actually making a profit on everything except iron. And the only reason I don't have any uh, major concerns about iron is because I can hover over my details here and see I'm only losing two iron and that's just going to my military wages. So I haven't built anything that requires iron. I'm not going to go bankrupt. I'm fine. But if I click on the specific ocean tile, and so there are two ways you can do it. You can click on the scope level button down here, or I can just click again, and it's going to cycle through them. In this case, you can see that this coastal sea tile, or in this case, just sea, because coastal is a different type of water tile, it is producing 19 food. However, it is consuming four wood because you have boats, and you need to make boats because boats don't last forever. And it's also making me a little gold, which is always nice, because there's fishermen and there are merchants. So that is a specialized tile, but you cannot upgrade it. So I, there's nothing I can build on here. Maybe that'll be something added in the long term. Maybe I'll make some docks or fisheries or something, but that's not a thing in the game and I haven't heard anything about it yet. So probably not gonna do a lot of, with water tiles. However, it also means that military units aren't going to show up and raid it because raiding is a very real part of this game. And if you want to raid, well, let's do a quick example here because this game is pretty intense. If I were to decide I wanted to move this guy, this house guard, out of my city, I would do so by clicking on Manage Units. This allows me to select from the garrison of this town, select a target and say, you're going to move here. You're now going to move them over to this new company, hit Confirm. It's going to cost you a tiny bit of money. I'm going to hit Finish. And now that's going to go into my queue. In 10 seconds, you're going to see these guys show up out here. At which point we're going to have a little more tweaking we can do to them, but uh, let, let's just wait for that. There we go. All right, so my units are hanging out outside of my city now. There is no one garrisoned, you can see by the zero, and this military unit is mine to command. There are new buttons here, so you can see move company, patrol, manage units, and tactical settings. Patrol is very useful because every unit has a zone of control, so to speak. This is a distance it's willing to engage enemy units at. This is how protective it is of its area. I'm going to go into tactical settings here. I'm going to talk a bit about that. So, stances. Stances help you decide where, uh, where and what you're going to be doing. Raiding stance allows you to raid things, but it also means you basically aren't going to move, and you're going to be very vulnerable to being attacked. You do not want to be caught from raiding stance by an army when you're, you know, in raiding. Because otherwise they will just tear through you unless you have a superior force and then some. Encamped allows you to regenerate, which is actually useful here. Because you can see force encampment. If you've taken losses, you stop moving, you don't attack, your area of control is basically reduced to nothing. And you're just trying to replenish your health. Defensive. I feel like it's pretty self-explanatory. You just or you're better on defense, you take less attrition. Offensive. Go ahead and guess. Uh, guard mode. This is great. So it does not move. You will no longer pursue anyone. However, it means that if you're standing on top of something you want to protect, so if I move my forces here and put them on guard mode, they would sit there, they would not chase anyone, which is important because your encounter strategies matter. 
Your encounter strategies are set on three criteria. When the enemy appears to be weaker, I want to pursue. When the enemy is approximately the same, I'm just going to kind of sit there and not do anything. And when the enemy is stronger, I am going to run the hell away. I can also say what level of damage I'm willing to take before I say, actually, let's not commit to this battle any further and instead withdraw. I can also decide to name the company in case you need to have... I don't know, the civilization-style urge where you name a unit and then suddenly you have conquered Arabia with the power of the Blue Gene Company. You can also choose to disband them if you felt like it, but there's not a lot of purpose to that. So I'm going to confirm that order, I'm going to send it in, and then we're going to look at something else. So, guarding. I can choose to say, hey, I want you to patrol between this area and this area. And now it will walk back and forth, and based off of how aggressive I want them to be, their area of control and whatnot, they will just attack enemies they see along the way. This is very useful for you to be able to, once again, leave the game for a duration of time without getting absolutely slaughtered. It's not necessary at this stage because you can't actually permanently conquer anyone else's land yet, because again, everyone's kind of learning, and as cool as this community is, there are definitely some of these guys I'm betting are going to be bloodthirsty, because that's part of the fun. So while you're learning, you're pretty safe, though. Uh, you'd set up your patrols, protect your land, build some troops, what have you. As long as you're economically balanced and you don't go away for too long, you should be fine. So I'm going to set up a patrol here. We're going to hit confirm on that. Make certain that's sent off. And finally, there's the move company option, which is as simple as clicking on a thing, and then it will tell you, hey, here's where you're going. I can add a new waypoint as to where I want to go after that. Very simple, I'm not going to commit to that, because I've just set up a patrol here, which I know will do nothing in this circumstance, but makes me feel better for demo purposes. As you can see, this is a pretty small world. There's not a whole lot going on, but it does allow you to get a sense of the scale. You can get a lot bigger, and there are going to be a lot more people. I actually started with a pretty nice selection of tiles to start off, because there's a hill over here. And because I have nothing going on in my feudum right now, I'm actually going to start claiming towards that. That's going to allow me to crawl towards a tile I want. What fact about waste tiles? Because I'm talking about stories right now, why not? Waste tiles. If you have a waste tile, you can claim next to it with more waste tile. You can then release the first waste tile and still have the second, allowing you to essentially inchworm your way across the entire map, which I have personally done before, and I would actually credit it with having won me the game, because I didn't have any mountains nearby, and I didn't want to risk trying to buy a bunch of iron all the time. So, there's something fun for you. We need to remember to commit that, because as you can see by the little exclamation mark, I was forgetting to do so. Okay, we have 15 seconds, and we're going to get a new season, I believe, which is good, because I want to see how we're coming along here. So five turns to a wooden palisade, uh, then we're going to recruit more troops. This is a feudum level order. And over here we have Erica Ball. Uh, Erica Ball? I don't know. I'm not an expert on these things. I can, however, see that this guy's actually claiming something, if I'm not mistaken. Or is that just my... <laughs> is that my cue or his? Okay, it's mine. But at the same time, if I wanted to, I could theoretically walk these guys over and stand them on this farm to raid him. It is worth noting that at this stage of the game, even though it is highly tweakable, so it is still being found the right balance of how much loot you get for burning somebody else's house down, which obviously is a point of contention for people who like to burn down houses versus people who like having a roof. Point is, if I sent my army over to sit on top of his farm, People aren't going to work there. There will no longer be food production there, which means I will not be gaining food from his farm. Essentially, if you're a peasant, you're not going to work because it turns out there's a serious case of Viking on the farm today. And as a result, he will starve. He will, you will actually destroy him economically just by denying his food, potentially, for long enough. Uh, but at the same time, if you're looking to get a resource, you should not stand on top of that resource, or you will have a bad time and wonder why on earth you aren't getting things because you raided, and it feels bad not to get the loot you so lovingly liberated from its previous owners. And of course, once you do get loot, you can see here the breakdown. I have 125 coming in from my feudums. If I had trading, I'd be getting some. Agreements, which I suppose would be something like if I had a vassal 
who was subservient to me, well, I'm taxing him for food, so that would come in through my agreements. Looting is my raiding stuff, and waste ground, which I don't think I've ever actually seen the waste ground produce resources for me, but it's interesting that that's an option. And of course, there's a decay rate because food doesn't stay forever, especially in a world where pasteurization and refrigeration aren't really a thing. Yeah, I mean, presumably one day this world will reach the modern age, but uh, it's probably going to have a slightly different culture from us. Louis Pasteur will not create the pasteurization process. It'll probably be some guy who was just trying to find a way to preserve leeches. Anyway, uh, we've got a lot of stuff going on here, but I think... Oh, that's the peak of a mountain. Good. So the art style, first and foremost, I love this game's art style. If I zoom out here, you can see that... Uh, there is two style modes, very similar to Civ in that regard. And very cheekily, the fog of war has just taunted me with the tantalizing prospect of a mountain I could build and get a bunch of iron from. Uh, so, if I decide to go mining, I can. Is this coastal? Am I lucky? No, it's a sea. All right. I was hoping to show you guys that, but that's fine. So this is basically your general setup. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a quick break and we'll come back in winter so you can see just how everything works because your food production is going to slow down your people are going to move slower i would imagine thanks to snow and if not well maybe that'll be something i suggest later and you're going to enjoy a slightly different dynamic for now uh i'm gonna sign off and i will see you in 30 seconds according to my own assumption of how long this is going to take see you in a moment ladies and gentlemen welcome back for you, it's only been a second. Uh, I had to wait a minute, but it's now winter. I just wanted to show you guys this because it changes the game entirely. I also, while you were gone, claimed this for my waste ground. This is a hill that I will eventually turn into something good. And we finished construction on our... I'm not going to call it a castle because, frankly, it's more of a tent with walls. But, hey, it it is a fortification. Let's go with that. We're almost done recruiting some new troops as well. I have queued up a church to go here. This will eventually go into my fiefdom, my second fiefdom, when the time comes. So as you can see here, this is my castle. This will allow me to recruit new guys, uh, new types of units. So I'm going to have archer militia, I think, is something I have by default. I think tribesmen, those are guys who are new, and light footmen would be new as well. Spearmen, light infantry... Slingers and Bowmen. I think all of those guys just got unlocked by me having a wooden palisade. Or palisade? I, I don't know. <laughs> I must admit, I have that, what's known as the Scholar's Curse. I've read a lot of these words. I've never really heard them said out loud. So anyway, we have the fortification here. And that's going to unlock more options for us militarily. Now, if I go to the specific tile view, you can see that it is costing me money to have this here and some wood. But the tile is still producing its natural food and stone output. So as a result, don't think that building on a tile and improving it is going to remove the benefits of that tile. It still has its base output no matter what. You can still have some random hunters and watchmen hanging out in that area. Now, you cannot build, interestingly enough, in a forest. I kind of would have been down for like a random forest fort, but I guess it makes a kind of sense because that kind of clear cutting would probably be quite annoying. Though historically, I imagine they probably would have just burned down the forest because we weren't real big fans of keeping to the environment. Stewardship of our natural resources was a concept. Besides, charred wood is good for the soil. Now, uh, we're building that church. I think that's about all we really need to be doing right now. Our neighbors haven't really expanded too much, which is nice, and I am trying to take this area now. We're going to attach it to the wasteland because it's the only adjacent area, and I've actually reached the max number of tiles in this fiefdom. You'll notice as well that if I went to... Where is it here? Do, 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 do. Feudum rules. I could change the rally point to the castle. So this is where newly recruited guys will show up. In this case, it already is set as that, so there's no point in me doing it. And appointed manor. So I could decide that the new manor is actually going to be this place. And say, select new manor. Uh, come on. Okay, well. Or is it already considered the manor? I guess it must be. Okay, well. Oh no, it's because it's not a castle proper yet. It's just a little 
Ah, okay, that makes sense. I was saying to myself, man, that's a weird bug, but no, it makes sense if you just read. The nature of this game is you will be confused until you read things. Oh, good, more friends, and they don't have the same shield, so I know this is another person. <laughs> Someone come to make things exciting. Yay! So, now that I have this original territory set up, I will be able to set up a second one in four turns. Ooh, don't forget to send in your... Uh, your rules here, otherwise your orders, otherwise you're not going to be able to do much. You can cancel these just by clicking on them and then saying repeal. You also have to confirm that, though, so don't forget that. If you don't send it off, the server will never know what you want and it just won't happen. And you'll sit there going, what's going on? I thought I queued this up. Uh, so, I have the ability... So, as you can see, it actually says blocked, which is really important because it tells you, hey, you can't do anything while they're on that tile. This is from Baron Marco Elliott, who has sent no idea how many units, but they have a strength of eight. They hit for eight. They have six melee power and two armor. So I'm assuming he's just sent over his basic intro troops, same as me, which is fine and dandy. Uh, these guys, I don't know if I actually put them on the defensive stance. That's worth looking at. So Ambusher adds an extra area of control. So they will attack from farther away and they'll do more morale damage. In this case, honestly, I think that might be the way to go. In case this guy gets a little close to my farm, my patrolling guy should potentially just charge him and maybe you'll get to see some combat. Oh no, he's running away. So you can move quite far in this game. You can scout with your troops, which can be very useful for reasons, uh, like I said earlier, where you're trying to build another fiefdom and you want some really good tiles for part of it. If you can't recognize the tiles at a glance, well, scrolling out does make them consistent. So you can see these are all hills. And again, I do love the art in this game. It's very well done. I I'm not associated with the dev team or anything. I'm just a very passionate dude who thought that this was a super cool premise. Uh, I'm, disclosure-wise, I supported it on Patreon, and I'm in their Discord server. So if you have questions, it's actually a good time for me to talk about that. The Discord server is surprisingly both active and super friendly. There's a bunch of guys who all have the lineages of stuff like, uh, from in my case, I'm Crusader Kings, I am well, actually a bunch of Paradox games, I'm Civ, uh, Sid Meier's Civilization, and of course I come from the Battle Dawn, Tribal Wars, what have you, browser-based games of yore. So, I have a decent amount of experience with this sort of thing. There's still a bit of a learning curve, but the reality is I've always gotten responses very quickly on the Discord, and I very much encourage you to come check it out. Even if the game isn't necessarily your fare just yet, join in, keep an eye on things, and get the updates, because there are some very exciting things going on. I believe what's coming next is diplomatic agreements, so you're going to be able to do stuff like non-aggression pacts, alliances, yada yada yada. So there will be a little more interpersonal activity as the game develops, and I think there's supposed to be one quite soon as far as patches go for that sort of thing. So that is the next big feature to ship. Oh yes, so I was right. So you can see here that specific tiles do actually cost a certain amount of movement points per each type of unit has a certain number of movement points, and then that is modified by their stance as well. So horsemen move faster than infantry. I'm sure that won't shock you. So we've just claimed another one. I'm going to add this again. So let's have a look at my wasteland now. Uh, yeah, as you can see, it's starting to cost me. So minus four gold, minus four virtue, which would be concerning if it weren't for the fact I'm trying to make a church right now. So I should receive a bunch more virtue over time, which is nice, because again, big, big boosts. While the building itself, this is something worth noting, while the church itself only produces five virtue, the jobs within it still produce quite a bit more. And if you max them out, so you can see monks here, they consume two food, they produce two virtue, two social well-being, and seven public health. So it does actually, it pays off quite nicely to diversify your fief a little bit to build these things. However, it is very hard to sustain a max level uh, city with just one farm. So I have a second space over here. That's probably going to end up turning into a farm. Uh, I am not going to queue that up yet because I do hope to eventually create my next uh, feudum from here. So we're going to pause again, and I will come back as soon as I have created enough 
territory here, or potentially the church is done, and we can talk a little bit about creating your second feudum. All right, cheers, and welcome back. All right, so you didn't miss a ton, but uh, things of note, I did a little scouting down here. Turns out there was no mountain there, so that must just have been an interesting visual bug. I have three waste tiles here, and we did finish building our church. Now, the important thing about that is it means I can theoretically, I know that I actually can't at this stage, but I could theoretically create a new feudum. The reason I can't is because a feudum is quite expensive to make. Uh, case in point, 1,450 virtue, which is not sufficient. However, because I have a church, you will notice my overall power here for, or my overall production for our virtue is at plus seven, despite the fact I am spending 12 of it on waste ground. So, because this waste ground is so expensive to me, because each one is minus two, I believe, and then that is significantly increased by the overall, I think it's a, there's a multiplier on here. The larger your waste ground, the more expensive it gets. So it makes sense. It is there to incentivize you to use the territory instead of just claiming it all and, you know, playing hungry, hungry hippos. Mind you, sometimes it is worth, for example here, if I wanted to stop this guy from expanding in this direction, I've sealed it off. Because as I stated previously, you can't claim a tile that isn't adjacent to your borders, be it wasteland or feudum. So in this case, I am going to take this opportunity to release a tile, which is a good way to show you what we're talking about. So you could abandon it or put it in the waste ground. But because this is already in the waste ground, uh, we're actually just going to abandon it. We're going to commit that order, and that should help speed up our virtue production, because it is going to take a minute here. We will see exactly how, uh, how long that takes, but you can also see that our castle is coming along nicely. This is what it looks like when it's not snowing. Uh, as I, I say castle, again, it's just some walls and a tent, but it is a fortification. This fort, as you upgrade, the visual style will change, and eventually it's going to be a lovely proper castle. This will eventually become a lovely proper city. As you can see, it has upgraded. Uh, I think this guy is using the same visual style we were, so you can see how it's changed a little bit here. Uh, we did have a another guy come wander by with some troops, so we do have a few players still about. We may actually end up showcasing a tiny bit of combat, it's not a total war style, hey, your dude versus their dude on a battlefield where you command everything. No, it's just your military stances, your zone of controls, and then the percentage based off of what policies you set on that military group and their individual military strengths. So it's not super in-depth per se in terms of micromanagement, but there's still lots of strategy to be had as far as the actual combat goes. That's an area that I personally think I could stand to work on, because I haven't done a whole lot of combat in the time that I've been playing, mainly because everyone's still kind of learning. I had a few cheeky victories where I just made a whole bunch of farms that were completely unprotected from wandering raiders, but I happened to be in, like, the furthest corner of a much larger map with a lot more people, so people would just bash each other into meat popsicles, and I'd be over in the corner uh, winning the game, as it turned out, in that one, because I happened to stockpile enough goods and population to be able to say, hey, I win, while uh, everyone else could have probably destroyed that entire plan. I played a very, very dangerous gamble, but it did pay off, so, you know, no regrets there. It is fun to win, believe it or not. And we do have breaking rights on the Discord when we do, so why not, right? So, this is where we're at feudum-wise. We're going to try and get as much uh, virtue as possible. I'm noticing that, dang, I am really, I don't know where a bunch of my, did it cost me virtue to release this too? I really hope it didn't, but, oh wow, it did. Okay, so, like I said, virtue, surprisingly valuable currency when you consider the grand scheme of things, because you can win with it if you don't have a use for it, and technically that means you always have a use for it, so... There you have it. We're going to step away now for a bit, and we'll I'll check in in a few ticks, and I'll show you how things have changed. Welcome back. So, uh, as you can see very briefly, I had somebody occupying my church there. I don't even know where he went. I was about to show it to you so I could go attack him. Well, that's okay. 
now is as good a time to check in. We did manage to get rid of that one tile, so our virtue is climbing. We're at plus 11 now. And if I, now isn't actually a very good time to show off that if I felt like it, I could probably assign some workers to that specific job. So if I go to labor assignments, how are we doing on monks these days? Now, food wise, I am producing 94. Timber wise, I am producing a surplus of 51. What does this tell me? It tells me I need less, I don't need as many of them. So, Let's see here. Late summer, let's get some guaranteed monks, because I, I would like to continue increasing my production here. So this is a, what, what is this one? This is a priest. They produce one virtue versus monks who take two food and produce two virtue. But priests, priests cost coins. Okay, well, let's focus on the monks, because we can afford that. Let's go 50, because I want lots of monks. We're going to keep production on virtue as a top priority at this stage. Can I confirm? I'm going to send that in, and that's going to allow us to produce a higher amount of virtue per tick. We just entered autumn. Now I'm checking, let me check my labor assignments here. Okay, so we are seeing that for early autumn we're harvesting crops so there's way less uh, general extra labor lying around. But as soon as we hit mid-autumn, uh, we can hit 15 laborers at this present projection. So we will start getting more. Winter is a great time for being able to do these extra jobs because you won't be producing food. Now, obviously, you do want to be producing food. You want to have a good stockpile ready to go. But once winter rolls around, unless you have coastal tiles, which, fun fact, is what was down here. You can see lake slash coastal. They produce quite a bit of food, but they don't give you the option to do merchant stuff and make some money from those tiles. So, uh, they're a mixed bag, depending on what you're looking for. But, they are quite useful. As such, uh, compared to your cost in wood and, well, just wood, but you get some gold for your trouble kind of thing. So, yes and no. There's some good, some bad that come with your lake versus your sea tiles, but coastal remain the year-round reliable source of food. So, at some point, I may end up building my second feudum into using them, because farms are difficult to protect, as it turns out. As long as your neighbors decide to start wandering over onto your territory, it can be a bit unpleasant. Here he is again! I think he's probably just wandering randomly trying to scout, but at the same time, uh, we don't like people entering our borders, so we're going to send over our guys with the intent of potentially messing with him. No, for certain, but hey, you never know. Uh, we are going for this place. We are going to confirm. We're going to just move over there. Truth be told, I could probably set these guys up on a new patrol path. So they're going to move there, and then I'm going to set them to patrol between this area. Let's say, yeah, the town and that area, I guess. Oh, I guess I can't tell them to patrol the town, because then be, they would be joining the garrison. So I suppose that makes sense. No 1,000 percent. Oh, that's just showing the zone of control. So you can see if they enter that area, a battle will take place. So we're going to commit just before the takeover, too. So the question becomes, did we... Ah, uh, they kept running. All right. Either way, I went to intercept. Didn't quite happen, but that's not the end of the world. Uh, I will check back if he decides to pop back in and we have a battle. Otherwise, you'll see me when we next have the ability to create a feudum. Alright folks, welcome back for our final update. As you can see, I have accrued enough virtue at this point that we can go ahead and create our next feudum. So that is exactly what we're going to do. Uh, updates is on my neighbors here. Nothing too exciting going on. Doesn't look like a ton of development. I never did find the other guy, but uh, don't worry. We're going to have our second feudum now, so I don't care. This will be the capital. We have added enough tiles, and we will... Let's choose a rank. Yes, it is the Gru feudum. Sure. Uh, no suitable manor set. Oh, yes. I need to actually designate the tile as the manor. Confirm, and send the order in. And now, in four seconds, we get a new feudum. Let me move this beam of light out of the way. 
I say that, no, it's not four seconds to the new feudum. It's four ticks. Whoops. That's okay. Uh, it just means that I have time to start claiming new stuff. I say that. I just lost a whole bunch of virtue, so maybe I should let that recover for a moment. But I'm not sure what happens if you get a virtue deficit other than your... Uh, your advanced troops that would otherwise take virtue. So, for example, these house guards take virtue for their upkeep. I'm pretty certain they would desert, but otherwise, nothing too exciting there. As far as uh, this particular troop, I actually have set them to high alert. So they aren't going to have as many action points, i.e. they'll move slower, but they have more maneuverability, which I believe helps in battle. And they have higher protection on defense and lower attrition. So, in essence, they should be better because they're only on a patrol between these couple territories. So, shouldn't be too bad, but that will put them into a good guard mode where they can still move. I also took the liberty of upgrading my city because it requires more upkeep, and I didn't have enough people to fill all the jobs I have. As you can see with a newly upgraded city, I now have the capacity for only two less people. So there would only be two vacant jobs, and that's totally fine. As you can see, health-wise, we have fresh water, we have specialist laborers helping with that, providing 79 health. And that means that overall, that's going to be a positive influence on morale and population. People are pleased, which I'm honestly a bit surprised by because I have not been prioritizing people. I had set my laborers to just build virtue at all costs, so I guess I kind of got lucky there. Total population. Change of local population is driven by migration and local growth. Uh, there is a death scale, so over time people do die, even if you get to max and you don't focus on growth. Uh, if you find equilibrium, you will still to go down over time. Maximum draftable population is 33 families at this stage, so I can actually draft more from that settlement. Having bigger ones does help. There is no hostile presence, so there's no pressure to uh, my population. And stability appears to be doing exceptionally well because I have some... I have some garrison, I have people who are happy for food... Uh, morale is good. Yeah, we seem to be doing okay overall, so honestly, not a terrible settlement. I'm not upset about how this has played out. And as you can see, my church here, I guess I should actually choose the tile itself. So the church here has 16 families for its 16 houses, so that's going to take some jobs away when it becomes the new feudum. So this will have room for another area to be built at that point, and another tile to be claimed, because we're taking one away. Let's see here. One more minute, and then we get our next feudum, and we'll wrap things up here. But, uh, yeah, so far it's been a pretty interesting little experience. I do, I, I love this game. Not because I put a hundred hours into it, but because I can see the promise. There's so much depth already, and we're still missing some of the more meta-level mechanics. I, I still can't set up a vassal ship. I can't do proper trade or diplomatic agreements yet with other players. And yet, just minding my own business in my own borders, building a pretty little uh, kingdom with a bunch of feudums hanging out, it's very satisfying. So I, I really hope that if you're like me and you come from a strategy pedigree or indeed you share my previous history with tribal wars, battled on, yada yada yada, you know the drill, uh, you'll be able to appreciate this for what it is. Because it's a promise of those games without the rot that removed all of the fun from it as soon as you got anywhere into the game. And as you can see, I have my second feudum here. This is the new capital and I can start building a second thing here. So let's say I want, so there's quarries and mines. Quarries create stone, and mines create iron. So we're going to go ahead and build a quarry, and then we'll queue up a mine as well, because that's going to be excellent. Uh, unavailable on this terrain type. I, are you sure about that? <laughs> yeah, no, that should be available. Let's try that again. There we go. So both of these will slowly build. So in 20 minutes, those will be built. Maybe I'll pop back in uh, and we'll we'll wrap things up then. So you, you kind of get a sense of what we're looking at overall. Maybe I'll do an upgrade on the castle as well while we're away. 
Because again, I don't need to worry about long-term sustainability. I can just show you some cool stuff. In the meanwhile, I'm going to take another quick little break here, and I will see you in just a moment through the magic of editing. And welcome back, folks. As you can see, some small changes have been happening, but more importantly, it looks like we're about to see our first face-off, if I'm lucky. Uh, I have told this company to move and attack, so hopefully they will. We are supposed to attack them, and they are not a stronger force than us, so hopefully they will attempt to attack. And then you might actually get to see some stuff. Not sure what the bag is, but I will figure that out in a moment. As I said, I don't have a ton of experience with the combat side of things. Uh, other things to update you on. As you can see, I have updated our new feudum a little bit here. We have our silver mine and our quarry. We have a farm and a hamlet that is being upgraded to a proper village. That way we'll have people to work those jobs, because people will not commute between feudums in order to do that kind of thing. It would appear I'm in the midst of getting invaded on every possible front. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Well, I can't seem to get him to attack at this moment in time, so I guess maybe he saw that there were two forces and decided to withdraw instead of commit to an attack. Also interesting little note, uh, it turns out that, you may have noticed, my crest has changed. This is actually my very first crest from the first time I created my uh, account for this game, so uh, that's kind of a fun throwback, but at least it gives you an idea of how much my crest has changed over time, and how you can end up with various different looks over time. I also updated, so this is actually a proper castle now, instead of just a tent with some wood walls. So, it's not a full proper castle, but it is a castle. <laughs> not intimidating, but effective, nonetheless. Are we actually going to fight? Is the game going to let me? This is the one downside of the combat, as I see it, is that I can't... Uh, what is it going? Okay, so it's trying to move there, I think, is what's going on. And you, God only knows where you think you're going. So we're just going to have you sit here, and hopefully you will decide to attack things. Let's change your stance. Uh, we will try and be an ambusher. If this somehow works, yay. If it doesn't, so be it. But I wanted to show you, because as you can see, we have our next feudum is developing nicely. We got a little bit of sea territory. Somebody's decided to creep over here with their wasteland to take some of my space, which is annoying, but welcome to the game. And in the full version, I will just laugh and then occupy this territory, because how dare they? But uh, for the moment, you put up with tiny nitpicks like that so that we don't get entirely steamrolled, which is nice. Now, I, as I said, I did build this village with the intent of being able to finish these jobs, or rather to fill these jobs. I don't know why the world market is open right now, but as you can see, there are 180 jobs. I only have 46 families here, which is part of why in two ticks this is getting an upgrade, so we have a little more room to do more jobs. On this side, we've taken a farm and another uh, forestry area. This is a known bug. Unfortunately, our... Uh, Woodcutters aren't always in the same season as the forest they're in for some reason. There, there are little quirks like these. Nothing that actually stops you from enjoying the game. Just a matter of understanding that it is in early alpha. Things are still being developed, much less fully polished. So, that is a thing. That said, if you have ideas or you enjoy the game, my god, it is one reactive community and developer behind this. I believe it's one guy programming all of this. His name is Matt. He's awesome. I like him. Uh, he is very reactive to the people who play, and he really likes getting feedback and input on things, so there will be things that change over time. This will not always and forever be the most relevant uh, intro, but at the moment it's probably the best one we have, because it's one guy doing this whole thing. And seeing as we don't seem to be fighting, uh, I am actually just going to call it here. Because uh, I don't think there's that much left to show in the current build. I could build out another feudum. I could go for one of our victory settings. Of which, you know, I don't seem to be winning at any of them. Because I've been trying to diversify a bit and show off all the functions. But that's okay. As it stands, I've had a lot of fun showing this off. 
Feudums is free to play on Steam. It has a demo that is persistent, so you're going to be able to play that from now until launch. So the earlier you want to get in, the better. And come join us on the Discord. If you decide you like the game enough, you can support it on Patreon and help make it a reality. Again, this is a game that firmly eschews any idea of pay to win. You're going to be able to get fancier looking shields. That's about it. Which I, for one, am all about because I enjoy this style of game and I cannot wait to see just how incredible the promise of it is as soon as it's been realized fully. So, I've been Showtime. Thank you for watching. Uh, you can find me on Twitch at Gaming with Showtime. I'm on Twitter as Gaming with Showtime, I believe. So, I'm I'm around. If you want to see more stuff, I hang around. I stream a lot of games. You'll see me Fridays and Saturdays usually. And I will see you all later. I hope you've enjoyed this preview of Feudums. And go have fun. Build one yourself. This has been Showtime, signing off.